A welcome from myself as well. My name is Bronik Boschek. I'm one of the spinal surgeons at QMC and current head of service. And I'm delighted to see many friends and colleagues from around the globe attending us. The activity at the moment is we have two courses starting, of whom the lecture. Can we turn up the volume a little bit, please? We have, we have two courses starting, which is the CODAS course and the anesthetist course, which is starting simultaneously. I feel like Mick Jagger now. <laughs> Okay, and some very wise advice from Sharif El Sayed to, if you have a medical emergency, dial 111. I think a medical emergency room of spine surgeons is probably not a good idea. Anyway, talking about stalking. Stalking, in order to stalk, as uh, Sharif alluded to, you need to be able to walk. And walking, a fundamental aspect of walking is how you use your spine when you walk. And we, we very much take this for granted that we can get up, walk around, and move quite fluently and uh, people assume that our spine is actually not well adapted to upright posture and to human locomotion. Actually, it is very well adapted, and I'll try to show you why. This is um, a sculpture by the famous artist Henry Moore, and this is his impression of vertebra. And this is the perception that many people have. When you look at the complex shape of vertebral bodies, it appears as this rather jumbled shape, but actually, we know and have known when we look at the various morphology of various species that form follows function, which is, which is a very well established principle. And we know that nature in the body does not make bones in any particular configuration without there being a reason for it. We still don't know why our noses are turned down, but apart from that, um, form follows function, there's a reason to the morphology. When you look at different mammalian species, which arguably have all evolved via the same route, the, the way in species, the way species uh, run, walk, climb is tremendously different, yet we all have the same blueprint to our skeletons. And the question then arises, in a spine which, which has the fundamental conflict of providing stability and mobility, so on the one hand you're trying to create maximum stability to avoid neural injury, etc., but you need this incredibly flexible spine, this is one of our nurses obviously who wants to bend over backwards quite frequently. Um, Charlie, that's right. And uh, so we, we try to optimize both stability and mobility, and the spine is caught in this conflict. The core of the spine is the so-called motion segment. The motion segment is built up of two vertebrae, the intervertebral disc and the facet joints. Now, the disc itself is a, can be compared to a gel-filled cushion, although there's no shock-absorbing function contrary to popular belief. The disc will allow motion in any plane. What guides the motion is the facet joints, and the facet joints are like rails and will allow motion in certain directions. It also provides for a very controlled center of rotation. So while providing stability, the motion that you can exert across two vertebrae is very controlled and very centralized. And this is just one of the very many um, investigations which illustrate how the facet joints guide motion. And the facet joints vary tremendously from species to species. So when we look at the different shapes, and these are the different shapes you find in mammalian species, it initially is not easy to really comprehend the different shapes and why different shapes are seen in different species. So what is the optimal design for optimal function? And what are the processes through which our spines adapt and evolve through age from being a fetus to these changes in the, in the spine and the joints? Our jo uh, sorry, wrong one. Our joints start off like this and they evolve and the joints eventually curve. What leads to the joints adapting in this manner? And comparative functional anatomy is a tool which has been around for centuries, which really enables you to crystallize what the uniqueness of various species are. So it's a very essential and, and useful tool. And some work we did a couple of years ago was looking at a range of species, and we found these specific shapes to be predominant in um, mammalian species. And I'll show you which ones we looked at. So, we selected marine mammals, the bottlenose dolphin, the harbor seal, because arguably the influence of gravity um, has been reduced. We looked at quadrupedal mammals, the cheetah, Przewalski horse, which is considered to be the forefather of modern horses, the llama being a pacer, the terrestrial bipedal mammals, the kangaroo and man, and arboreal mammals, the chimpanzee, and the orangutan, the female orangutan, because a female orangutan rarely descends to the ground. The male orangutan is a lazy creature, 
and pretty much remains on the ground all the time. So the first of these is the bottlenose dolphin. And when you look at a dolphin spine, what is interesting is that thora the thoracic spine has facet joints, very small facet joints. And as you go down the lumbar spine, these facet joints dwindle. So this is a thoracolumbar junction, and you can see how the facet joints actually um, resolve until the mid-lumbar spine, and towards the tail region, the spine is actually devoid of facet joints. So you have a very round vertebral body and no facet joints in the end. And if you look at dolphin locomotion, the propulsion is really by sagittal strokes of the tail fluke. So there's a, a lot of axial load, but very little torsion, um, which is also not required for their form of locomotion. So, oops, sorry, wrong computer. So the loading pattern is mainly axial compression, not much torque, and certainly no anterior posterior shear. The same pattern can be found for all whale species. And if you look at the spine here, these are the facet joints. And you can see how these facet joints actually dwindle. So the dolphin doesn't really have any use for facet joints. In contrast, if you look at the seal, the joints have a mainly sagittal alignment. Again, a very round vertebral body, but a sagittal alignment. And the, the, the way a seal swims differs from that of a, of a dolphin in that it uses its front appendages and its back appendages to steer and change direction. So the seal includes torque and torsion in its form of locomotion, and hence the explanation for the sagittalized facet joints going hand in hand with us. And the mobility of a seal spiral is quite remarkable and very, very different from that of a dolphin. So you have these alignment of facet joints, but no anterior portion to the joint to absorb any form of shear. The cheetah, arguably the fastest land mammal, has a different gait from all other mammals in that it, ha in that it has two flight phases. So the cheetah, most gallops have one flight phase. The cheetah has two flight phases, and through the active extension and flexion of its spine, it adds about 10 kilometers per hour in speed. So it can actively extend and, and flex its spine. Oops. It can actively extend and flex its spine to, to increase its speed. And as you can see in this video, we've all seen this, but it can only keep this up for a fairly short period because it's very taxing. So the, the joints correspondingly allow for absorption of torsion and anterior shear, but the majority of stabilization is muscular. So this tremendous flexibility comes at the cost of stability, which has to be compensated for by muscle. The contrast is really seen when you look at horses and modern race horses. This is, this is a Puelski horse. Modern race horses have gone much further down this evolution. In the mid lumbar spine, the joints have uncompassing facet joints, so they actually have this posterior curvature. The lumbar sacral junction has these very small sagittal um, facet joints. And in contrast to the cheetah, the gait is what is called dorsostable, means the actual spine does not move much during um, the gait of the horse. And the loading the loading patterns of the horse are mainly in actual compression, lots of torque, but what the horse does is it's fused its transverse processes to a large degree, and there's a very large lumbar sacral hinge. So they're actually articulating surfaces between the transverse processes and the sacral ala. So this creates a tremendously stable um, hinge across the lumbar sacral junction, limiting the motion to the lumbar sacral junction, saving energy, which makes the horse a far more endurance-oriented animal compared to the cheetah and, and other species of that nature. And this, of course, is why a horse is more pleasant to ride than many other creatures, because the, the spine is reasonably stable. Um, prefer people wouldn't fall off horses, though. We included uh, the llama um, as a representative of animals, animals that pace. So the camelids are pacers. Pacers means they move the left side and the right side in unison. So theoretically, there would be less torque. We excluded camels because of the, the camel's hump. We thought biomechanically that could cause problems. And we focused on the llama. And the llama has these uncompassing joints. So it has these joints which curve over the top. And it's not entirely easy to explain this. And when you look at the locomotion, I couldn't find a video of llamas, unfortunately. This is a camel pacing. Now, unfortunately, it transpires that all camels also gallop. So the llama and camels gallop. They are not pure pacers. And the explanation for the encompassing joints is posterior shear. So those mammals, which pace a lot and have less muscular stabilization, have posterior-oriented shear, which is compensated for by the superior encompassing facet joints. And the probably most extreme um, variation of this 
is seen in the ibex. And the ibex has these joints which actually fit together like a key in a lock, providing a very osseous stable configuration. So the homosacral junction has these very strictly encompassing joints and the regions above that have this almost facet joint type of lock. And the explanation for that is the increased posterior shear. So posterior shear in the ibex is a major factor. When the ibex lands, and it's a different gait to other, to other animals, you create a quite substantial posterior shear through the translation of the lower part of the body versus the upper part of the body. And this is compensated by the uncompassing joints. Now moving on to the bipeds, kangaroos are fascinating in that they have two different joint shapes along the spine. The lumbar spine is characterized by flat joints. These are, there literally is no curvature in the lumbar joints of the kangaroo. And the kangaroo gait, of course, is characterized by loads of shear going anterior shear directed through the lumbar sacral junction in its hop. But kangaroos also have tails, and they use these tails quite creatively. So on the one hand, the tails are used to support them when they fight each other with feet. And the sacrocaudal junction, so the junction between the sacrum and the, um, and the tail vertebra, have curved joints. They're very much like human joints, actually. Actually, the most common, most comparable to human joints of all the species. And interestingly, if you look at the slow grate of a kangaroo, what the kangaroo does, and you'll see this little one do it in a moment, is it supports its front legs and tail. So the tail is actually used in locomotion, and the base of the tail gets a lot of torsion and rotation. So not only does it need to absorb rotational force, but it needs to provide motion as well. So in one animal, you have both joint shapes. You have a flat joint, which is perfectly adapted to absorbing all sides of force and torsion without allowing any motion. And you also have a facet joint shape, which allows rotation while absorbing the same forces. The orangutan, and as I said, the female orangutan is the one which spends its time in the trees. The male orangutan does not, for obvious reasons. And this is the typical gait of an orangutan, beside quadrupedal climbing, manual climbing, is brachiation. So it's the movement across trees with, with, with both arms. And I find it fascinating how the little ones hang on to these, hang on to these mothers. It's quite remarkable. And there's a lot of torsion, not much shear involved in this type of gait. Now, the chimpanzee has similar gait patterns, and the quadrupedal walking of chimpanzees is very different from the way we walk. Chimpanzees are not usually able to walk upright in a very um, structured fashion, and again, employ brachiation um, to a greater degree. And this is an example of brachiation. Gibbons are fantastic at this, um, but chimpanzees exhibit this form of gait quite well as well. So the motion pattern is different, and chimpanzees show fairly large curved joints to absorb this form of shear. And there are obvious differences between the human pattern and the chimpanzee pattern, which I'll come down to. While well, modern humans can walk and they can employ torsion of the torso against the pelvis, chimpanzees cannot do this to the same degree. And this is probably the best video I've seen of a chimpanzee walking, which is actually remarkable. So the gait of this chimpanzee is tremendous, although it cannot extend across the pelvis and has to go back down onto all fours. And it cannot run. Chimpanzees cannot run on two legs because they cannot twist the upper body against the lower body. So adding these factors together and looking at the human spine, our spine is special. Well, it's not special, but it's different to the others. We have a very large, we have a very large facet surface and curved portions in our joint. And our spine has to deal with tremendous forces in torsion and in shear. So we can sprint on two legs like no other mammal can. This is pretty unique. And the forces that are transmitted through a human spine are tremendous. So there's a lot of anterior shear, a lot of rotation, and our joints are actually the largest surface area joints of the entire range of species. So we have more surface area than all of these species. We also have the largest discs. We have the largest end plate surface area, with a max value of 13 square centimeters of all these species. Our discs, even though we are fairly small creatures, whales aside, um, but dolphins, all the rest of these species, we have larger discs. So there is something quite unique to our, to our um, spine and that our spine can distribute these tremendous loads. And when you start calculating the forces which go across this fairly small disc, our torso, the only bit connecting our torso to our pelvis, is this much of vertebral body. It's not a lot, and the forces are quite tremendous. When we look at the adaptation of the joints, we see that the facet joints are very well adapted to absorbing the anterior shear loading. 
and yet we can flex, bend, rotate in all various directions. And axial rotation, as you will have gathered from my talk, is one of the essential features for bipedalism. So we need to spend a bit of time and understand the axial rotation, which we take for granted, but is not something which is to be taken for granted. So a bit of biomechanics here. When we rotate the spine, the initial axis of rotation is in the vertebral body. As soon as the facet joint comes into contact in rotation, engages, the axis of rotation is transferred to that facet joint and then further rotation occurs across this facet joint. And just bear with me for a couple of minutes. You only need to understand this once and I find it very useful for the comprehension of how the motion segment works. Now, this rotation is resisted A by the annulus. So the facet joint engages, the rotation is resisted by the annulus and the contralateral facet. Now, th the facets, this function is pretty unique in that you physiologically have joint surfaces which separate or tend to separate. Other joints do not do this. And the function of the posterior joint capsule is to tense up and limit this rotation. So axial rotation is limited A by the contralateral facet joint, the anterior annulus and the facet joint capsule on the contralateral side. And they work in unison to stabilize the motion segment but allow rotation. So without the curved joint, you could not do this. And you could not transfer your, your axis of rotation. And the facet joint capsule, often in surgery we just ignore this, but it's a fascinating structure. The collagen structure is transverse and the ultrastructure of the facet joint capsule is such that it wraps around the joint. So this is the inferioricular process here and you can see how the joint capsule actually curses around the inferioricular process and wraps around and absorbs this force. And the immunohistochemistry of this is that there's fibre cartilage which is adapted to absorbing <coughs> compression and shear in this region. And this is a normal facet joint. So this is the cartilage, lots of cartilage, and the facet joint crossing across the cartilage. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Now why is this important? It is important because the distance from the joint to the facet joint capsule provides a lever for resisting rotation. And if you measure this distance in different species, unsurprisingly, this is from cranial to caudal, so this is the upper lumbar spine to the sacrum, this distance is widest in humans. So we have the widest distance of the facet joints of all mammalian species. So that means our torsion is really high. Now if you look at the primates, there's a very interesting trait, and in then humans, this distance becomes wider towards the sacrum, whereas in primates, it becomes narrower. So Throughout evolution, there's somewhere there's a link where we've gone this way and primates have gone that way. And that anthropologically is quite interesting. So the, the interpretation of this is that our torque is mainly in the lumbar sacral junction and our spines are adapted to torque in the lumbar sacral junction. And certain sports activities show specific adaptations to this kind of torque. And if you look at elite cricket players, and Nick Pierce kindly provided me with a scan, you can see how one joint is hypertrophied and is very much more sclerosed than the other. So our spine, even with our basic foot pattern, can still adapt to four the degrees of torque. So in elite sportsmen, you see quite interesting adaptations. And in chimpanzees, not wanting to draw a similarity, um, in chimpanzees, the torque is more concentrated across the, lumbar, the thoracolumbar junction. And the interpretation is that the pelvis rotates against the, the rather stiff um, thoracic spine. So, so what happens in evolution? Somehow we have gone from here to here and, and the anthrop australopithecines are our link. And when we look at the, the spine, it provides very good clues as to the ability of bipedal locomotion in these very, in, in our four, forefathers I suppose as a way to, foremothers as a way to interpret this. Now the chimpanzees have these rather flat joints, humans have these more curved joints, and if you look closely at the cast, there's very cu various casts of the australopithecines around, you very much get the impression that this is a, a spine which is pretty well adapted to torsion and rotation. So the interpretation of the bony morphology in this and in the specimen in the Lundgren History Museum is that in fact the australopithecines were fairly adapted by bipedal locomotion. So it's not just the knees and the pelvis you can look at, the spine actually provides pretty significant um, clues to this. And a very recent paper in another australopithecine that was found, again, the spine shows configurations which are compatible with bipedal gait. So the question then arises, what gives us the shape? Is it fetal development or is it genetic development? Now if it's genetic development, it'll just occur if it's 
mechanical, so form follows function, then you have to have these factors arising from a very young age. And if you look at fetal vertebra, you can actually see these cartilaginous buds at the lateral aspect of the joint. So are these genetic or are they mechanical? The only way to find out is to look at how fetuses move. Embryologically, what happens with the fetal joints is they're different from other joints and that these are joints which form by approximation. So the joints, the, the um, joint process grow towards each other and then from the interaction the joint is formed. And these are slides from my anatomical mentor, Reinhard Putz, which is part of his very early work. So this is a fetal joint, inferioticular process, supraarticular process of the fourth month, and you can really see how the lateral aspect is starting to curve. So again, here, inferioticular process, super, sub, inferioticular process, supraarticular process, and something is shaping these joints. We can actually see movements of the fetus from nine weeks and before. So the question is, do these fetuses rotate? And actually, this is some work which my wife did. If you look at a 10-week-old fetus, um, this is the aorta, and you can see the body contour, the pelvis moving against this. This is in slow motion, and again, the fetus actually actively rotates against the pelvis. From the 21st week onwards, the, osseous, the centers of ossification are visible in ultrasound. This is the pelvis, and this is the spine, and you can actually see how the, the pelvis rotates against the rest of the torso. So the human fetus already provides actual rotation and torsion from a very young age. And if you measure these, some are very active in rotation. Segmental rotation, you can measure it, goes up to 8 degrees, and the frequency is up to 15 per 10 t, uh, uh, rotations per 10 minutes. So fetuses are quite active. There is a mechanical stimulation, and through the rotation, the lateral portion of the facet joint is stimulated and provides stimulus for growth. So this is the imputation of the facet joint morphology arising and of course as we start to toddle and walk this is further stimulated and developed. Now what happens when we age? This process doesn't stop, this process continues and whilst our disc loses its hydration what happens is that the annulus becomes lax. So the resistance to torsion which I alluded to initially in the annulus is lost and this needs to be compensated by, by the joint. So what happens? The joint is stressed, more force is resisted by the contralateral facet joint which creates stress along the capsule and thesis. And it is the capsule and thesis which hypertrophies. Now, if you look at CT scans and histological findings, if you look closely, this is the actual facet joint surface here. The facet joint stops here. And this hypertrophy is from the enthesis of the facet joint. It's not the facet joint surface which hypertrophies, it's the attachment of the facet joint capsule which hypertrophies. This is the original joint surface, and you'll see in the histological section here, the joint cartilage is gone. All this cartilage is hypertrophied and thesis from the facet joint capsule. It's not the joint surface, it's the capsule, and the capsule has to work very hard to resist this. What happens over time is these osteophytes come into contact, and as soon as they come into contact, they start remodeling. And the result eventually is restabilization. So you go through this phase of instability, restabilization, restabilization is achieved through encompassing facet joints which is a function of the facet joint capsule. And non surprisingly, nature has already done this in other species, so we go down the same track of form follows function to again restabilize our spines, which I find a fascinating feature that you also have this in an, in an evolving aging spine. <coughs> so bringing this to an end, um, the principle of form follows function is evident in mammalian facet joints. The entire ultrastructure of the spine is very well thought out, well not thought out perhaps, very well adapted, and every detail in the spine has a function. The mammalian facet joints have a high degree of specialization and our spines are certainly very well adapted to upright posture and locomotion. What they're not so well adapted to is what we do with our spines. But upright posture and locomotion certainly we are very well ad adapted to. And I'm indebted to multiple um, photographers and sources for all these images of course. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>